In Canada, there once reigned an institution so supreme that Catholics shook and Protestants reveled. On the troth, she donned her sash and made the streets orange. She was faithful to the king and the king of kings and proclaimed, civil and religious liberties we will maintain. This is, but rather was, the story of the loyal orange institution in the Dominion of Canada. Firstly, what is the Orange Order? The Loyal Orange Institution is a fraternal organization of the Protestant faith that is monarchist, British, and Tory in character. The order originated from Austis County, Armagh in the year 1795 and then spread throughout the empire's glorious bounds. At the forefront of the order's praise is King William III of England, the Prince of Orange, and the cause for the veneration was his triumph over Popery at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. Undoubtedly, with the exception of Austis, the Dominion of Canada be the most receptive through the order, and wear the sash of orange. Now, the primitive origins of the order in Canada are found within the first lodges, such as in Halifax in 1799 and in Montreal in 1800. However, these lodges were made up of Irish soldiers serving in Canada, so they were not Canadians. Thus, the true founding of the order is needed, and is to be found spiritually within the first truth of July Parade in the city of York, which is Toronto, the Belfast of the East, taking place in the year 1818, inheriting the advent of the Orange Ascendancy, and physically, the establishment of the Grand Orange Lodge of British North America in the year 1832, with Oreg Robert Grauen as the Grand Master. Thus begins the story of an Orange Canada. The ideology of Orangeism proved attractive to all sorts of Canadians, and not only to those of Irish heritage, chiefly to the English and to the Scottish, and to a lesser extent, to the German and Indians of Canada. The Lodge also united Protestants of various denominations, chiefly Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Methodists, all united underneath the Orange Banner. However, it was the Irish who had first introduced the Order, and made up the greatest base of support, and they were as well the prime evangelists of the Orange cause, helping her to rise to prominence, a prominence that compelled a possible third of the entire Protestant male population to be a member at some time in the late 1800s. With this established, the order began to spread throughout all of Eastern Canada, with the exception of Quebec, where they were only able to furnish her lodges within the minuscule pockets of the Anglophone diaspora, principally in the cities of Montreal and Quebec. The sole reason of which is to be found within one thing, the religion of Catholicism. I'm happy to say everywhere is progress reported with the exception of the province of Quebec. There our brethren have popery in all its forms to contend with, their popery has its withering influence, sought to suppress and destroy the liberty which Orangemen hold so sacred. Thus the order would only be able to expand in the lands of Protestantism, of which there was none greater than Ontario. Ontario was the jewel of Canadian Orangeism. After all, she was built upon the settlement of United Empire Loyalists, Protestant Tories that would not betray their god or their king, and a rejection of the American treachery. Thus, Orangeism's seed fell on good ground and produced a crop, 100, 60, and 30 times that which was sown, wholly permeating the province. Newfound settlements in Ontario would first build a church, then an orange hall, and finally a school. Already settled areas would be no less supportive of the order, rather on the contrary. The cities of Toronto and Kingston would respectively become known as the Belfast and London Dairy of Canada. The spur of orange support was steadily enforced with the migration of Irish Protestants and with the conversion of native Protestants to the idea. It was as well Ontario's Orangemen that would be the missionaries of the order, spreading it throughout the prairie and the Pacific. As the newly established Dominion of Canada expanded her bounds, Orangemen were at the forefront, and whithersoever they tread, the order tread as well, in accordance with Orangism's support for imperialism, thereby allowing the Orange Order to make its way from east to west, from Bonavista to Vancouver Island, and marry Usk Admer. The order was already consolidated in the east, so she would expand west and expand her grasp over the nation. That they successfully did, with the exception of one notable western province, British Columbia. The order in British Columbia proved feeble, as the province's strife was not betwixt Catholics and Protestants. Her conflict was of labor, the worker against his boss, and the right against the Oriental. Hence, the trade union would replace the orange sash, a blight for the order, as the order had arrived in British Columbia in 1863 well before the prairies, which proved metaphorically and literally more fertile towards the order. A shame, as the order had first believed when she arrived. It will be gratifying to the brethren to know that this offshoot from the parent stem already gives fair promise of becoming a goodly tree, whose branches will spread over the entire Pacific coast, 
yielding much fruit and affording shelter and protection to the weary, wandering brethren of our lands. To encapsulate Orangism's failure in British Columbia, Little Prince Edward Island would rival her in number of lodges. Other than Ontario and the Anglophone regions of New Brunswick, which practically were an extension of the province, the next greatest space of Orangism would be the curious case of Newfoundland. The advent of Orangism in Newfoundland was rather late, with her first lodge being founded in 1863. The lodge had to depend on English support rather than Irish, as the Irish in Newfoundland were Catholic. Now, the colony of Newfoundland already furnished a large sectarian element, thus the added allure of the order's ritual and rite would entice many men to join, allowing for steady growth. Primarily those happened first in the Protestant strongholds of the Albion Peninsula, then throughout the rest of the Isle of Newfoundland. Lastly, reaching desperate Labrador and the Red Bay settlement in 1910. Unfortunately, not arriving at the greatest settlement in that region, Happy Goose Bay Valley or whatever. <laughs> The popularity of the order helped spawn Sir William Croker's Fisherman's Protective Union, proved by the FPU's adoption of many orange customs and with the General Catholic's refusal to support the organization. The order's influence was so great in Newfoundland that it affected many of the realm of politics. The most notable political accomplishment of the order was the realization of her long espoused idea of a Newfoundland within the Dominion of Canada. It was perfectly articulated in 1892 when Grand Master Clark Wallace wrote, Newfoundland has long formed a federated province of Orange British America. May not a day be long before distant before, added, a rugged province descending on wide Atlantic. Before I continue, I just want to apologize for that atrocious Newfie accent. Love you boys, but it had to be done. Anyway, coming into fruition in 1949, when Orange Man Joseph Smallwood became the first premier of the newly incorporated province. The Great Tide of Orangism created two new Orange organizations in the latter end of the 19th century. First was the Orange Young Britons, OYB, created in 1869 and acted as the youth wing of the order. And the second organization was the Ladies Orange Benevolent Organization, abbreviated LOBA, created in 1889 and was the FEMA branch of the order. Orange benevolence manifested itself in a multitude of different ways. The most obvious is how as a fraternal organization she would provide both friendship and connections to the men within her ranks. The order would as well provide the community with social events, normally after her 12th of July prayer. Their benevolence is as well financial, with lodges giving financial assistance to her members. With an example from Loyal Orange Lodge 126 in the year 1877, imposing a policy of compensation for those unable to attend his usual employment through sickness or accident shall receive the sum of Orange $2, Purple and Blue $2.50, Royal Arch $3, weekly until his recovery. This benevolence as well led the order to operate the Loyal True Blue and Orange Home, established in 1925, an orphanage within the Orange Fortress of Ontario. Lastly, the order provided medical and burial assistance to her brethren. Many two tombs around the nation are adorned with orange symbols. King Billy is not only on the wall. Certainly, the Loyal Orange Institution was a benevolent one, and her kin went on to do benevolent things. Just Orange Man Tommy Douglas, the father of Canadian healthcare. The order's loyalty to Britain meant a loyalty to her empire, and thus the loyalty to imperialism. This is manifestly seen within the zeal and support Orange Man always gave to the empire, even in the most youthful and vulnerable stages. For example, in 1837, Orange Man readily defended the Tory government against Mackenzie's liberal rebellion, and they always championed God and the empire in all subsequent conflicts such as in the Fenian raids of 1866 to 1871, which were against her antithetical enemy, the Fenians. And in the Red River Rebellion of 1870, the catalyst of such was the murder of an orange man named Thomas Scott. The order's loyalty was apodictic during the Second Boer War of 1899-1902, which I have a video on, so you should go watch it, with some lodges even closing due to the ranks of men volunteering for service. However, it was the Great War of 1914-1918 to that was the apex of Orange loyalty. It was said in 1916 by the Orange General Sam Hughes, 50,000 of our members from this jurisdiction Canada on active military service, a boast of both honour and loyalty for the Orange men. This courage and glory was never again to be repeated or echoed so loudly. After the Great War and the Roaring 1920s, two international tragedies initiated the order's slow decline, the Great Depression of 1929-1939 and the Second World War of 1939-1945. The Depression meant that Orangemen could no longer pay their dues and therefore had to leave the organization. 
clearly illustrated with the most afflicted province of Saskatchewan losing 30% of the largest during the crisis, as compared to the national decline of only 15%. Whereas the Second Great War, on the other hand, showed a lessened orange influence in the military and the deaths of many honorable orangemen. However, the gravest factors in the fall of the renowned order is to be found in three simple things, all occurring sometime shortly after the Second Great War. The death of the British connection, the decline of the Protestant faith, and ecumenism. Canada's British and loyal identity truly died out sometime in the 1960s, as exemplified by the replacement of the Red Ensign in 1965 with our modern maple leaf flag. This treacherous move was denounced by the last Orange Prime Minister, John Diefenbaker, a very beautiful man, who passionately declaimed, Ladies and gentlemen, a flag that does not contain the greatness of your heritage is no flag for a nation, any nation. The final blow to the British connection in Canada is the lack of British immigration to Canada. Religiosity has overall declined in Canada and has reflected Protestants in addition to Catholics. And for the Protestants that remain, the order does not prove an attractive ordeal. Commenting on ecumenism, it fits well with our culture's wholehearted support for tolerance and acceptance, thus making an ardent anti-Catholic position untenable for mass support. Mr. Presley, I call you to order. The order of four Prime Ministers, including the illustrious Sir John A. Macdonald, the lodge that once held Toronto with an iron fist, with 20 out of 23 mayors being a member from the years 1850 to 1950, the institution which boasted in 1870, the new county of Muskoka is the most thoroughly orange county in Ontario. Literally seven out of the 10 settlers in the vast region are orangemen. Such a phenomenon as a Roman Catholic is hardly to be found. Fell, and fell greatly. Her very existence is not even known by many today. So is the undertold story of the Sash Canada once wore.